I'm in. I'm in, Frick, so. All right. Three, two, one. Hi, Eight. folks. Where are we on which camera? Secondary to start. Welcome. Is that, is that plugged in? There's a, pl there's a wire hanging down to it. They can see you. They can see you. Okay. I. <laughs> you never know around here. Welcome to our Friday, Saturday night YouTube Live in support of our Purple Heart Project, where we tell you all we know, and hopefully you give us all you got, something like that. Tonight we have a very special guest. Actually, we have several very special guests tonight. We have Moose back for the first time in how long? A while. A couple months anyway. Actually, it's probably been even longer than that. But he's on the mend. Tells me he might even get on the ice this week. And then we have a... Uh, Hang on. A, another very... Oh, we can't see him yet. I'll save that for a second. Ken's here with us. Frick's behind the green screen. Jake's behind the camera. Maggie's here. Um, guard dog brought in by Rex and all the way from the west coast part-time San Diego part-time Roy Washington Wait. Oh. Okay. you on Jake where's Jake right there. I don't have a signal Coronel Luther Sheely that would be an R in front of that Coronel okay can we start right off with a question uh, sure, yeah. Let's dig right in, and then we'll we'll hit you with some stuff as we go. Okay, Danny in Australia. Rex, excuse me a second. My mug in there, please. Danny in Australia. Danny in Australia time, right? wants you to demonstrate the method to sharpen and set up a Stanley Number 12 half veneer scraper plane. He says he has one, but he struggles to get it working as designed. Did he, did he call it a Number 112? It says number 12 and a half. 12 and a half? It says number 12, and then it says one half veneer scraper plane. Veneer scraper plane. Danny, I'm not sure, brother, what you're talking about. Uh, I'll show you what I have. Are you on, Jake, or no? Yeah. no? yeah, he is now. Yeah. So let me introduce you what I use. Uh, this is a 112. That's not the first. So this is made by Lee Nelson, but it's patterned after a Stanley. This is a number 85 scraper plane. This is a number 80. This is probably the most commonly owned scraper. Now, there was one that had a, a, a wooden sole on it. I'm not sure what number that was. I, I was never big into scrapers. I always preferred to plane, but you'll find out that when you're dealing particularly with exotics that you sometimes don't have an option. You have to scrape. But I'll go through and I will set up one of these and hopefully it will mirror what you're doing. Um, uh, what else have you got, Frick? So the I, I want to get a little bit farther into it before I do, I do tear into that. The, the first question was from uh, David in uh, North Carolina. He says, how do you properly sharpen a scraper? David in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's not... <clears throat> I mean, that's going to be central to this whole topic. Why don't we wait a little later... So more people are... You're going to oh, get that oh, question oh. later oh, on? Oh, okay. I'd say the audience numbers. How many do we have on? 274. Okay, 274, and we usually have somewhere around 800. So the only reason I'm, I'm pausing a little bit on that is because if I do it now, I'm going to get asked 100 more times as the audience builds. So uh, it, if it was a real... It, I'll answer any question, but that's going to be a demonstration, so I'm going to put that off a little bit. Make sure we come back to it. Okay. Wow. Okay, next one, Frick. Yep, David in Austin, Texas. I mean, easy one. Are all scrapers made from the same metal, or is there a difference? Are all scraper blades. So, um, now I don't know a ton about metallurgy, but I know enough to explain it, how it pertains to woodworking. So, I'll give you some examples. We'll take a, uh, a chisel. We'll take... A saw. We'll take a plane blade. I'm trying to avoid this magnet. And we will take a, a scraper. 
and that could be a, that scraper or it could be any one of the scrapers out of these. So um, the idea in working wood with metal tools or metal edge tools is you want it to be as hard as possible to, so it'll stay sharp as long as possible but at the same time you can't have it so sharp that a it's brittle and b it becomes very difficult to sharpen so they have a way of testing this the uh how hard metal is and it's called the uh, rockwell scale and it's a little bell bearing of sorts and under a certain amount of pressure they will create a dimple in the steel measure the depth of the dimple and that will give them that measurement so as an example this uh, IBC steel is somewhere between 60 and 62 this saw blade is somewhere around 50 this chisel is somewhere between 60 and 62 this scraper is somewhere in the low 50s and these scrapers would be somewhere in the low 50s um, talk about the hard ones first you you want to be uh, you can't you can't sharpen a plain blade or a chisel with a metal file it's too hard the file won't even touch it it's, it makes a terrible noise when you do it these this and these you can because the way you prep them involves using a file so this one has to be soft enough that you can manipulate it with a file in order to sharpen your saw blade, you have to be able to do that with a file, so that's why that has to be in that soft category. Whereas these two are done strictly with stones and bench grinders in order to get the primary bevels. So the answer to the question was, are all of those scraper blades somewhere around the same? And I would guess and say, yes, they're probably all in that lower 50 on the Rockwell scale. You get too soft, and they won't hold an edge. And too hard, I had, uh, I had a fellow make me uh, some plane blades one time, and they were 64, I think, is what he said. He sent me three of them, and one of them came with a big chunk broken out of it because it was brittle. So while you could still you oh, and I couldn't sharpen it. I, at the time, I had Japanese water stones, king water stones, and I couldn't touch it. I literally could not make a mark on it with that. I was able to do it later with diamond stones, but regular water stones wouldn't touch it. So the sweet spot for planes and chisels is in the 60 range, and the sweet spot for saws and scrapers is in the 50 range. How's that for a concise answer? Are you sure these are 50? Yeah. <coughs> they're, not a, they're not a regular Lee Nielsen blade? Don't believe so. I could be wrong, but uh, I, I, well... Shall we see if we can? Oh, that was nice. Jake's always one to challenge me. It's all right. I'll just see if I can if I can touch it with the scraper with the uh, chisel the or with file. the file. No, that's that's hard. Mm. That's that is going to be sitting in the same range as the plain blades. I stand corrected. Whereas I can go in on this scraper, which is made by Lee Nielsen, and I can relatively easily file. Pardon the squeak, but you can see the filings coming off of that. I couldn't do that to that. I can do it to that. So the scraper in that number 80, that is soft, but I'm assuming now that that Lee Nielsen blade is going to be the same. Good call, Jake. <laughs> now be quiet. I had, had to stop the fake news. Yeah, fake news, that's right. Next, Rick. Ken, your phone's on the floor. Did you want to... Uh, Apologize? Yeah. No. No. All right. Did you get him on, did you get him on <laughs> camera? Well, get him on camera. Luther, turn your face around here. Howdy. So he's been here with us for a week. And he's got us all saying, "Can't Washington, Washington, and can't." And show nuff. And show nuff. Next one, Frick. All right. Next one comes from uh, Peter in the United States. Doesn't say Peter? where specifically. 
He says, when it comes to the Stanley and Lee Nielsen scrapers, 112, 85, and the smaller 212, which do you think is the most useful? Well, so I represented Lee Nielsen from, 19, from 2000 to 2008. And uh, didn't leave on the greatest of terms, but I wasn't stupid enough to uh, sell my tools that I'd fallen in love with. However, I did cull the herd somewhat because... Um, I've, there's just some that I never needed. I didn't keep the of the three scrapers that you mentioned. I didn't keep. Let's see if this works. What's the matter? It's cutting out. I didn't keep the two twelve. So that little small one, I just didn't. Uh, I, I found that this, if you've got a large surface to do, then the one twelve certainly comes in handy. And the advantage of keeping the eighty five is the fact that you have the rabbiting capability. You can work right into a vertical surface. You can't do that with that one. So I kept those two, a bit of a luxury. Did, did he ask, say, oh, oh, so you said which of the three? So 212 is out, 112 is out, 212 is out, sorry, the small one. And if I had to choose between these two, I probably would choose this one as the, uh, the first number one and this number two. But together, they, they pretty much cover the basis. However, you know what? This is so. Here's the here's one of the reasons why. If you're using just a cabinet scraper, you have no reference. You have a cutting edge only, so you're going to end up doing this and following the waves, and you got to be careful. So when I do it, I'll go on an angle like that because by, on an angle, at least you're you, you're reading more reference surface. If you're planning with the grain like this then it's going to follow the bumps and it's just going to make them worse. So when you introduce some sole to it, that sounds so groovy. When you introduce some sole to it, it gives you a reference point so that you're not necessarily digging a hole. And of course, the longer the sole, the straighter, flatter, sorry, the surface is going to be. So this one, number one choice, this one, number two, you can tell the fact that there's dust on them that they don't get used a ton. And this one, number three, which is not made by Lee Nielsen, it's made by Stanley. Next, Rick. Okay. Just before you actually answer that, so if you're a combat wounded veteran that has been in one of our 13 or 14, do we have, how many classes have we had? Shoot. 13, you can say out loud, they know you're here. Thir we've had 13 classes. We've had 95 combat wounded vets go through our program. If you're one of those and you're on there, we would love to hear from you and give you a shout out. And I'll throw one out right now. Kevin Burris is in uh, Carthage, New York. Kevin's wife, Christine, is sick with COVID and I talked to him earlier today. Hopefully she's on the mend. Christine, we're all praying for you, so get better. You have to run this uh, growing business of Kevin's. I'll talk to you a little more about that later. Big shout out to Bob, Bob Abbott, who's, uh, I saw an interesting picture of him today. I can't unsee. Uh, Jeff O'Connor. Jeff, Jeff is here. Yes. Big shout out to Jeff. Jesse Rufian is here too. Oh, Jeffy's on. Jesse's on. Good. So Jeff just retired on, Janu on December 31st. He was a uh, Navy EOD. And I'll talk to you a little more about Jeff because I've been working with he and Bobbert and Kevin and Danny Bell then I'm down in Maine and Danny and his, his uh, three, four children and his wife, Jenna. And you just said Jesse, Jesse Rufian. Well, Jesse is, so Jesse was one of the first two Canadian soldiers that we had, Jesse. And uh, Jesse came the same time that Kyle Perel did and Kyle's in Newfoundland. Jesse was at the time was out in Alberta and he, he retired shortly thereafter. And uh, Jesse is uh, RCR, uh, Canadian Artillery, Canadian Infantry. And Jesse was, was wounded in that friendly fire involving the uh, USA-10 in Afghanistan back in 2007 or 8. I can't remember exactly. Which. But anyway, so, Jesse, so uh, actually, when I get over to that table, I got some stuff. I'll talk to you about Jesse as well. So howdy, Jess. Anybody else, Frick? Who's uh, watching that tonight? Doc, Ken is? Doc Bailey is. Yeah, Doc, Ken, Ken, Doc Ken. Bailey is a uh, corpsman from the, uh, the uh, corpsman attached to the Navy, Vietnam era. Navy <coughs> corpsman. Navy corpsman. to the Marines. Navy corpsman attached to the Marines. Well, I stand corrected. You want to 
Yes, I do. Please. Uh, so just just before you just before you say that, how are we going to you how to get my attention? How are how are they going to flags? What do they need to do in order for Ken to pick it up on it? Pick if up they on put it. the uh, at symbol and then start typing Ken, they should have the option for Ken Anthony. So just tag him and he'll be able to see it. Okay, so you put the at symbol and then Ken and then type your name and then uh, Ken will uh, see it and mention it. Ken, who do you have? Uh, Kevin Schmira. Hey, Kev. From Bama. Brother. Alabama. Bama. Bama. Jack Lane's on. Kev's been in the shop a lot lately. Jack Lane, Jack is in, Jack Run is the uh, our commander in chief of the Bench Brigade, and we'll I'll I'll mention that a little bit later as well. And then Sneaky Pete. Sneaky Pete. Pete Ambrose. Oh oh, that's not Sneaky Pete. Oh that's right, sorry. But is, is Pete Ambrose on? Sneaky Pete. No, Sneaky Pete. But Sneaky Pete wasn't what was he's he wasn't one of our uh, combat wounded vets class. But if you if you happen to see Pete Ambrose, I haven't seen him in the last little while. Make sure you tell me. Okay, Frick. And Ken, just please interrupt me anytime. All right. Next question comes from Joshua Parker in Abilene, Texas. Hey, Josh. He says, do you, ever use a, do you ever use glass as a scraper? And if so, would you, when would you choose glass over a metal scraper? Um, first time I saw that was in 1987, and I think Peter Korn demonstrated it. And what they did is they were using little, um, the little pieces of glass that you use, you, you put a specimen on underneath the micro, microscope. Now they would they and they they were sharp. They broke. It's a little bit of a dangerous thing too because the glass is relatively thin. So I don't. I never use it. I don't ever use it. And probably the most the uh, most unorthodox. Or I shouldn't say unorthodox, but the uh, one tool that I occasionally will scrape with that you might consider not typically a uh, thought of as a scraping tool is a chisel blade, and you can do that by just going in and using a sharpened scraper, a sharpened chisel, to scrape in an area. If you have a small bit to do, but you're, you're dealing with such a small surface area, it's not probably the most ideal, but it'll work. Next, Rick. Okay, next question comes from... Notice my hat I'm wearing. And the mug I'm drinking from tonight, you'll hear me use it more than once. All right, Steve back in St. Mary's, Ohio. Hey, Steve. Is there one particular brand of scraper that is best, or what are your top three brands? Of scrapers? Yep. Well, we actually have some coming, so we're going we're gonna to bring our own. I mean, it's not the, um, if it's all the same steel, it's all the same steel. It doesn't really matter. And, I mean, it's just, that's what it is, right? Uh, this one is 25 thou thick. We're going to have them. We're going to have them 15, 20, and 25. But now, for, now Luther's over there uh, jumping up and down, probably because we don't have them yet. But we will have a selection <laughs> of scrapers coming. But I don't think it really matters what brand, as long as they'll hold an edge, so that you want them, as we mentioned, in that 50 range. Go ahead, Frick. All right, next one is, comes from Phil Doddridge in 100 Mile House, B.C. Hey, Phil. How much should the scraper be curved when installing it in a holder, and what does various curves do to the cut? Well, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that because I don't put any, unless you're talking about a radius, you may be talking about that. So on the number 80, and this is probably the most common scraper that people know about so that i when i sharpen that i just i sharpen that straight from there to there i don't put a radius on necessarily put a radius on there because on this scraper so this is going to be used in this direction so on the back side there's a thumb screw and that goes right through you can see it right there can you see that it's just going to push against the blade and what that's going to do is it's going to <coughs> When you put this in place, it, yeah, now, so I've got this, there's a bevel on this side, the, the bevel is on this side, and this side is facing the back. So on a flat surface, I would put that down in there, and then I would snug these up, keeping, keeping the uh, scraper flat and the blade flat. 
Now, if you weren't picking a, a shaving up right there, what you would do is you would start to just hit that a little bit. And what that's going to do is it's going to cause it to bend a little bit, which means it will make this go below the surface of the scraper and you'll start to pick up a shaving. And if you really crank it, well, you're going to get a, you're going to end up cutting a, uh, I wouldn't call it a dish, but a slight curve. When you're using a scraper like this, you typically are holding it with your thumbs and you're pushing on the backside. And that too is causing it to dish ever so slightly. On this plane, where that scrape, that blade is 3 16 of an inch thick, you're not going to bend that. So if you wanted to, to avoid plane tracks, scraper plane tracks, you could go in and do the same thing we do on a plane blade, which is on the last part of the sharpening, just do some circles pushing down in one corner, and then the opposite corner. And the only problem with that is that, that the, um, the bevel, the primary bevel that they come with is usually too steep. So you're trying to do it up here. And if you try to do that on a stone, it's going to squeak and squeal on you. So I purposely go in there and cut that back. That's probably cut back to about a 45 degree, and that'll make it a little bit closer to the actual angles, or I shouldn't say the angles, but it's going to make it a little bit closer to the way you would plane sharpen a regular plane blade. So no, no great amount of, I don't put any radius intentionally other than I just feather those outside corners a little bit, again, just to minimize the plane tracks. Next, Rick. How are we for numbers? Uh, we are at 473. Ken, any more? Uh... Uh, Sean McDermott. Hey, Sean. Sean McDermott is the creator of the Sean Shim, which I hope we have back in stock very soon. In fact, we will next week, won't we? Bob Addis, I'm sure mentioned him. Before. Yes, yes, I did. Yep. So let me just uh, quick brief you on what we do here. So this is uh, a way that we came up with several, several years ago to help us, actually not only to help us raise funds to do our Purple Heart Project, but also to allow people, in fact, I would like to think we do it more to allow other individuals to participate. Uh, with the exception of COVID, on a normal year, we would have six classes starting in May, one a month, May through October. Class lasts for six days. We call it training the hand, and that class consists of six very long days, um, jam-packed full of um, fundamental woodworking skills, hand tool woodworking. We don't use any machines with the exception of grinders for doing the primary bevel. First day we... <coughs> Excuse me. First day, we learned to sharpen, all done freehand. Second day, we learned to uh, use a hand plane. Uh, third day, we learned to dimension lumber so that you can take it something that is rough and make it flat, smooth, and square on all six surfaces. The next day is dovetails. Next day is mortise and tenon. And the final day, we're putting all that together and building, finishing a project that we build. But basically, you get skills in... in you learn to sharpen and use planes and chisels and saws. Um, sometimes we throw a little bit of scraper, a little bit of scraping work in there. And woodworking, hand tool woodworking is proven to be very therapeutic, particularly for those suffering from things like traumatic brain injuries or PTSD as a result of uh, battle uh, injuries. So in each class, we have seven spots that are for paid customers and seven spots that uh, come that are um, scholarship spots for combat wounded veterans that have applied and been accepted to our program. If accepted, we cover all of their expenses, airfare, excuse me, airfare, hotel, meals, we feed them here, and every vet goes home with a full selection of tools. I think it totals $4,000 or $4,500. And thanks to the bench brigade, they have a bench that goes home with them or will be waiting for them when they get home. So they can literally set up a little shop in their... Uh, they could even do it in the spare bedroom. So, of course, it's expensive. It's going to be even more expensive now that airfare and everything has gone up, but that doesn't matter. We still do it. 
So if you would like to participate in that, we have a means on our page, robcosman.com. You open that up on the top left-hand side, is Purple Heart Project, and you pull that, pull that down, that menu down, and it'll say, how can I help? And it'll give you the options on what you'd like to, uh, would like to donate. And, and Rob, by five minutes, I'm posting the link uh, to PHP donations in the live chat. So you can just click on that uh, live link and go right to the page. That that'll, take you, that'll take you to it. Yep. So to say thank you, we, um, we do a draw every night we do this. We always give away three Purple Heart sweaters. I'm, I'm Purple Heart sweaters. Purple Heart Dead Cats, that's what this is. That's what Moose sells in his stall in our city market. And you have the option of a golf shirt with the Purple Heart logo. But for every $1,000 donated, we also give away in a draw, and, and I'm sure the link is coming up for the draw, a gift from one of the uh, vets that we're working with who have started businesses mostly in the uh, handcraft industry. We buy them from them, and then and we buy pay retail, and they will ship it to you. So we actually changed that around a little bit to make it a little easier, since most of our our um, patrons are coming from the U.S. Uh, this is Bob Abbott's work. This is Jeff O'Connor's work. Kevin's will be here shortly. This is this is Jesse Rufian's different story altogether, but. Tonight we're giving away one of Bob's um, tumbling, block. tumbling block boards and one of Jeff's, uh, this one just came, this is U. So this is a uh, U brush, shave brush with badger hair, real badger hair. And this is the bowl that he turned. And that's the, uh, a friend of his actually makes that shave butter. It's fantastic. It smells delicious. Yes. So that's what we give away. And they all ship it directly from them so that it won't take so much longer coming from Canada. So, and over here, I'll introduce Angie while I'm here. I meant to put her picture over there. So one of our team members who hasn't had the chance to get here yet is Angie, and that's Ken's cousin. Angie is uh, confined to her bed because of an illness, but as soon as she's better, she's coming here to work. We have her locker out there for her. And Angie and her sister Lynn do all the packaging of our Purple Heart t-shirt. So if you haven't got one, get one. And you'll see right up there, there's a little logo picture. And she has her A on there for her approval. That's Angie. So you can get one of our Purple Heart t-shirts. You can get yourself some maple syrup. What am I, hawking stuff now? <laughs> and I'll tell you a little bit later about these cute little sweaters. Next question, Frank. All right, next question comes from uh, Kevin. Look at Moose for a second so that they don't have to stare at me when I blow my nose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just one step above. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Papoose. Yeah, little little Moose, you got Big Moose and Little Moose. You can walk around. Hmm. There's not much face. to see. Not much to see. He's <laughs> a <laughs> sweet. Okay. I got no one rubbing my back. <laughs> uh, this next question comes from Kevin Windsor. He says, have you ever used the Kev ulti ultimate scraper from Stuart McDonald? Never have. So I don't even know what you're talking about, so I can't comment. Sorry. All right. uh, so we have a question from uh, Tyson Underwood. It was also asked by Rick McKinnon in the chat. Hey, Tyson and Rick. Uh, they want to know what difference does the scraper's thickness make? Uh, well, so we were talking about card scrapers. It's just going to be a little bit stiffer. So I actually prefer the one that's stiffer just because it doesn't flex quite so much in your hand, whereas that thin one flex, flexes a lot. So that's the thicker one. But I can't, think of, I can't think of an application where I would pick one over the other. I think it may be just personal preference. If I do... I'll let you know, but I can't think of one right now why I would want one. I suppose maybe if you were doing a surface that was radiused, I mean, you could follow it with that thin one. You could literally bend it, bend around it. And, but other than that, I can't think of a reason why. So then why would someone want more than one thickness? Um, well, they're not expensive. Just try it. You just might like the feel of it. Robert? 
a bunch of different thicknesses, and I find that if I've got a really hard spot, like a knot, really hard knot, where you want to, I really want to flex get, it, get out there. I use the, I'll tend to use a thinner one where I can really flex, flex it, and get. But you got to be careful because you can really gouge the wood. So I have like three thicknesses depending on the difficulty of the wood, how the wood is curved, you know, and how much I want to bend that scraper to get at it. That's hey, that's a, that's a really nice hat you got on there. Thank you. I found it in the road the other day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did you eat what was wearing it? <laughs> <laughs> next, Frank. Uh, okay, next one. Uh, John Kasaruski in Longwood, Florida. That's is that how you pronounce John's name? I don't know. I, I know where John's been. Kasaroski. Customer of us for a long time. Hi, John. I know he's in the chat, so he can correct me if he wants. Um, he wants to know when do you go to the plain held scraper blade versus using a card scraper. <laughs> as soon as you burn your thumbs off. One thing about using a scraper, a card scraper, is it gets hot fast. You can be using it, and all of a sudden it's ah, oh, and it burns them. A lot of people actually wear will wear, wear, wear gloves. But the single biggest difference, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, is this has a sole, so it's got a big reference area, and it doesn't allow you to, or I shouldn't say it doesn't allow you, it will help you keep the surface flat. But as Luther mentioned, if you've got one little area that's got a little bit of tear and you want to be able to get at it, in order to do it with that plane, you're going to pretty much have to take the entire surface area down. Whereas you could take a card scraper, you can flex it with your thumbs in the backside, and you can actually work that little area. But he also mentioned you have to be careful because you'll actually take it out of flat enough to, to notice. One of my favorite tricks on a card scraper is to combat the heat for your thumbs is put a little, like a refrigerator magnet. On the back of it, so you can. It takes a, a while. Little cushion? No, just no, no. because insulation. Insulation from the heat on the metal. So I just grab. I have a bunch of refrigerator magnets, and I'm gonna use it. How I'll, about if you just got some tougher hands? That that works too. That works too. But yeah, just a little trick. Band aids, anything. But if you haven't done it before, you'd be surprised at how fast it gets really hot. Might be an advantage to the little thicker one too. Next one, Frick. Next one comes from what time was Phil that? Doddridge. Hey, Phil. Uh, how much should the scraper be curved when installing it in a holder? And how does various curves, and what does various curves do to the cut? Okay, read that one again. How much should the scraper be curved when installing it in the holder? And what does various curves do to the cut? Okay. Now, I'm not sure what he's referring to when he talks about a holder. I think he's talking about <coughs> several companies. Oh, that... that. Yeah, there's several companies that will make a holder where you can stick the scraper in. It's kind of like a Stanley 80, but maybe plastic or wood. It's got a nut, and it'll, it'll bend it for you. And you, you know, you're scraping, you're just holding the holder instead of holding the scraper. Is that a means of... of, of keeping, keeping your hands from, from burning. burning? Yeah, okay. I don't use that. Sorry, I can't. I can't comment on that for you. I very old school. We're about five forty now. If you wanted to demonstrate sharpening, and we've been in about forty minutes. Five four. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, uh, actually, give me give me another ten minutes. You. What time are you? What time are you doing your deal? Uh, what what time? On the hour. The on the hour. The, okay. The hour. All right. So I'll I'll take another. I'll take a few more questions. Ken, any more vets to say hello to? Uh, no. Ahmed John. Danny Bell, we already mentioned. Yeah, Danny. Dan and Ahmed. Ahmed John. Congratulations, Ahmed, on your on your uh, your big win last night. He shooting, com shoots competitively. Frick? Um Casemore Damon in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. How is this name pronounced? Casemore. That's his first name? Yep. Casemore? If it's Italian, it's Casamore. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Uh, he's from Louisiana. And he says, is it possible to make scrapers from old hand saws? And if so, could yep. you explain how? Yeah, absolutely. It's the same. It's essentially the same steel, right? 
you can if you can file it, it's going to be the same. You want it to be somewhat malleable, although you do you you can make or the blade in this plane is hard, harder than that, as we showed. And you can still it's still malleable enough to, to put an edge to roll an edge a little bit. I'm gonna do that shortly. How would you do it? Well, uh, this is what you want to end up with. Something approximately that size. So if I was taking that out of a whole, uh, an old <laughs> handsaw, and you don't want to burn it with a grinder because that'll, that'll uh, soften it considerably. So somehow cut it out, and then you've just got to straighten the edge, and you can do that with a file. So it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But you got to remember, these are, these are really inexpensive. So I don't know how much work I would put into uh, grinding and cutting and trying to salvage a blade off an old saw, just make a scraper out of it, unless it had a lot of sentimental value. They're probably the least expensive woodworking tool you'll find. Spend a heck of a lot more on the other tools getting it to prepare it. Next, Rick. Okay, next question comes from Michael McDonald in College Point, New York. Hey, Mike. He says, is there anything a scraper can do that I can't do with a number four high angle blade? Oh, good question. So I get asked this a lot. In fact, uh, people would call and say, uh, they go to, they, when I was, particularly when I was selling Lee Nielsen, and I used to handle all the orders myself, and they would call to order a scraper plane, and I would inquire and say, what, what, is there anything in particular you're working with? And I said, yeah, I got some bird's eye maple, or I got some hard walnut or something. I said, well, you know, a plane properly sharpened will handle that stuff beautifully, and it actually give you a better surface. So I used to, I've often told people, I can't think of a domestic hardwood that you cannot plane better than you can scrape. But as you get into the Janka scale, which is the hardness test for wood, you'll cross a point where it just does not respond to a plane blade and you have to scrape it. And what you'll discover is the harder the wood is, the better it scrapes. And the softer the wood is, the less, the, uh, the less gooder it scrapes. Is that how you would say that, Luther? The worse, the worse, that's how I would say it. The worse. Yeah. Pine, you can't scrape pine because it'll just bruise the surface. So I would always try to plane before I would scrape. And with a good, sharp, plain blade, you can make that surface flawless. If you want some help with that, um, if Luther can add the link to 32 seconds to sharp, it's a video that we did. And please don't ask me, why is your video 40 minutes long if it's 32 seconds to sharp? You're not there to watch me do it. You're there to me to teach you how to do it. But he'll put the link in there, and I'll show you how to sharpen a plain blade quickly. Next, Rick. All right. Kind of a similar along the same lines. Todd Michael in Leakesdale, Ontario. Hey, Todd. Uh, assume w Leakesdale in Ontario? Yep. Assuming both scraper and plane are optimally, sharp, optimally sharpened, which one is the best for highly figured grain like bird's eye maple? The plane blade. Plane blade. I can take a piece of bird's eye, I got lots of it, and we can just, we can plane it and just turn it into a mirror, meaning you plane the surface, you hold it up like that, and you can see the reflection of the ceiling on the piece of wood. Plane blade. If you're, if you're not able to do that, then I would suggest that you need to, um, this is in terms of how, what would I would check first. First thing I would do is I would check my sharpening because that's most likely the problem. And then there's a slight chance that it may be your plane. If your plane is not holding your blade securely or if there's bits and pieces in your plane that don't contact each other properly, and what I'm referring to is where the frog sits into the sole of the plane. On cheaper planes, it's not a very secure setting, so it allows for a little micro vibration and that's all gonna take away from surface quality. But if you've got a good solid plane, like a, um, a Lee Nelson or a Wood River, and you've sharpened properly, there isn't a piece of bird's eye that you shouldn't be able to plane perfectly. I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna have to dig a piece out and show it to you. Next, Rick. Jose in Chicago. Hello, Jose in Chicago. He says, in previous broadcasts, it was mentioned placing a micro bevel on scrapers with the ruler trick. Will this approach work with the Stanley 80 scrapers too? Yep, yeah, I'm gonna show you that. I'm gonna demonstrate that. It's probably a good point time. Yeah, yeah go good ahead. Good time? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> well, 
Do you, um, new, do you have a new scraper blade? No, but I, I got one I've never prepared. So, when it comes to preparing scrapers, and there's there's uh, multiple articles out there if you went and looked through old fine woodworking magazines, and a scraper blade is a lot like a plane blade in the sense that you're talking about a cutting edge that consists of uh, where two surfaces meet. So on a plane blade, you're talking about the primary, the bevel and the back, that's your cutting edge. On a scraper, you're talking about this edge and this, surf and this surface where these two meet, that becomes your cutting edge. On this one, similar to the plane blade, you've got your bevel and your back. And what I couldn't figure out when I would watch people demonstrate that is doing the polishing the edge and just just let me back up just a second that edge is only going to be as good as the level of polish that you have applied to this edge and this edge so that where they the two meet you don't have it full of scratches or serrations caused from the manufacturing process and i can understand how you can quite readily do this edge on a stone holding it square i have a little device i'll show you how i do it but when it came time to doing this, they, they would set it down there like that, and they would use their fingers to try to put pressure. Well, all you're really going to do with your fingers is put a shiny spot underneath where your finger was because this is too thin to disperse the pressure. So if I've got one finger right there, there's very little pressure here, and there's very little pressure there, and there's a lot of pressure right underneath my finger. So when I flip this over, I'd see a shiny spot here and it would dull off in both directions. So how are you actually going to get a highly polished spot that goes end to end? And that's where I came up with an idea. And that's what I'm going to walk you through. So I've, I had to make one because I lost mine. This is a piece of torrified maple just because it doesn't absorb wood. And I've got... Moisture. Pardon? Moisture. What did I say? Wood. Doesn't absorb wood. <laughs> But none of, the, none of their woods absorb wood. So I've got some uh, rare earth magnets, and I've got them sitting in uh, a 5 8 inch diameter hole. Now, I better pre-drill those. I'm going to screw them in place with a couple of number four screws. That's the right size right there. And this is my Yankee screwdriver, which I Yankee really... Yankee drill. My Yankee drill. That's a Yankee screwdriver. Well, they make a screwdriver. I like using this. I'm looking, I can never get that one to fit. That's not in there. It's terribly bent. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't that hook in there? There. Everyone's happy to see Moose back. Everyone's happy to see Frick with all his fingers. Now this steel cup increases the strength of the magnet by a huge factor. So when you're making this, now this one is sitting a little bit low. I'm gonna see if I can put a, uh, I'll put a little bit of tape on the back you side. Punch the tape? No, I was just going to cut it with. Ken, have you got, you don't have your little, uh, never mind, I got mine. Very rarely do I actually find that. So as I was saying, these rare earth magnets if you put them in a cup, make 
them a whole lot stronger than they would be otherwise. You want the surface or you want the uh, magnet to be sitting just a little bit below the surface. If you go too low, then you're going to sacrifice the strength of the magnet. And if you're sitting above, then it's going to be a, create a bump. And in case you're wondering, I'm using a number zero Robertson screwdriver. Super Dave on tonight? With his what? <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to take these magnets. Make sure there's nothing on there. I want that to sit in there flat. Put that in there. Not easy to get out if you uh, have to change something, so you want to make sure that the head of the screw is sitting below that surface at the bottom of the cap, cup, there. Now, just to make it a little easier on my hands, I'll just cut a little chamfer. So I mentioned that this is torrified, so they send, they cook it at a temperature that would normally burn it, but in the absence of oxygen, it doesn't burn. And I'm not sure exactly what it does to the cells, but the way of checking to make sure it's been properly done, they immerse it in water for a period of time. And if it absorbs any water at all, then it wasn't done properly. So, makes for great stable wood. Now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do my scraper first. I'm going to use this tool, which is another piece of torrified maple. And what I wanna do is just clean it up Make sure things on the bottom are square. Take some off the bottom. I'll take one of these that has never been done. That one hasn't, hasn't had any polish on it. So the first thing we want to do is we want to get that edge nice and straight. So I'm going to use a file. And you can, you can drag this over the, you can drag that over the file or you can run the file over this. But I'm just going to go front to back. Now we'll come over here, and I'm going to use my all Shapton system. Grit, Greg, Jake. Five. So on this side, I've got 16,000. I'm using my Shapton lapping plate. I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to flatten this. 
these stones are sitting on heavy holders, which is a separate part, but I like it because it makes it so much easier to work with. So what I'm about to do is I'm going to make this edge square to this face and straight from here to here. I've got to get rid of the filing scratches. Well, I don't want it to uh, tip over, so I'm not, I can't accurately do this holding it like that and keep it square. So, and if you want, you can put a little dish soap on here. I'm going to set this down, which we don't want to do that like this. So now it's holding it square, and I'm not worrying about this piece of wood wearing away my stone. The wood will wear a little bit, but I can always clean it up like you saw me do. Now, while I'm moving it forward and back, so as not to cut a groove in my stone and to preserve my stone and get as much use out of it as possible, as I go forward and back, I'm going to rotate I'm not only holding the piece of steel tight to this little jig, but I'm also using my palm to push down on it to apply a little bit of pressure. We don't have any <coughs> soap here, do we? No. I'll speed this up. Now I'm going to get my magnifiers on and have a close look at that and I should be able to tell when all of the file scratches have been removed so that 500 grit stone is going to produce a matte gray surface I don't know if you can pick that up or not But I, uh, I think that is good. I always like to second guess myself just a little bit. And by that, what I would mean is I'm going to go in, I'm going to do just a little bit more. Keeping it tight. Okay. Now, I'm going to put one grit in between instead of jumping right up, even though it's, it's not that big of a deal to, uh, to go right to the 16,000, simply because it's such a small surface area, but I'll do one intermediate step. I'm using a 6,000 grit stone. I didn't sharpen or flatten this one. Lubricate that. Oh, Jake. It's right there. Yes. Could have just lifted up that stone. And found it. The side. Same thing, just on a finer stone. Had this much excitement all week, Moose? It's crippy. <laughs> Most of these people wouldn't know what grippers are. If you're wondering how much pressure I'm applying, uh, it would certainly squish a firm grape. Let's have a look at that. Okay, now I'm looking to see a level of polish that would be above the last stone. And I think I've got it. I don't know if you can, if I try to hold that steady. So that's 6,000 grit. And that's how you tell that you've done enough to eliminate the scratches from the previous 
stone. Now I'll go right up to the 16,000. Probably should wipe this off, but I don't know how much it, I don't think it ever carries anything over to contaminate. Set that down on there. Anybody speaking up, Ken? You can really see the reflection. That was pretty good. Is it? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm speeding through this so as not to take too much time. So that's the 16,000. So that should look a little shinier still. Tell me, Luther, if you can see it. Well, I'm a little bit of a delay here, so... Oh, well, can you hurry? I can see it. Fine. Yeah. Looks good. Okay. Now, that's one edge. Now we've got to do this one. And this is the one that is a pain. Because if you try to do it the way most people show, I don't know how you could ever possibly actually get it done. I'm only going to do one, because you would do the other one the same way. So I'm going to go start backing over. I'm going to go start backing over. I'm having a hard time with my English. Spent too much time with... Uh... Uh -huh. It's only been a week. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my little gizmo on there like that. And then I'm going to find my steel rule. So this is the sharpening rule that we sell. It doesn't have any teeth on it or, or markings. And I'm going to use the Charlesworth ruler trick, but modified for a scraper. So by setting it like this... The block is going to allow me to put, is going to disperse the pressure so it's going end to end, or edge to edge. And because it stops back here a half an inch from the edge, and because the opposite edge is being held up by the rule, then right now the front edge is touching, the back edge isn't. But when I put pressure like that, it's going to cause this to lay flat, which is going to put more pressure right out here. Actually, I'm going to move this over just a little bit. It's going to put a lot of pressure right on the cutting edge. So I should be able to go in there and in a lot faster amount of time than if you were doing it with just fingertips alone, you should have a little polished strip right along that edge. Now I'm moving side to side just a little bit, just so I'm not wearing one area of the stone excessively. So what we've got, if you look closely, we've polished right out to the edge, even there where it didn't, it, it didn't go nearly as far in, but it went right to the edge. So I would say the job is done. However, I always like to I always like to be sure. Now what I'm doing is just switching sides so that I'm not or I'm evening evening out even evening mm -hmm. out the wear. I'm kind of leaning on the left side of the uh, block. I should have made that block a little bit wider. I would have liked to have it or oh, at about the uh, actually I can do it. I can just move it out there. Look like that. You only have to do this once. Okay. Now we'll go in, switch to the 6,000 grit stone. Again, we're just going to chase, chase away the, uh, the 500 grit scratches. Now, if you know me, I normally would be using a 1,000 grit, but Jake likes the 500, so Jake wants, Jake gets. Right, Megan? Let's have a look at this. Okay, 
that just a little bit more. I'll switch this stone, slide the steel rule over. The only downside to this is it makes your hands black for about a week. Okay, now we're going to come over to the 16,000. Now I don't want to move too much side to side because that'll, actually it really won't change your angle that much, but I don't want to move a ton. I wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't want to have that edge way in here. I think that would end up wrecking that little flat spot that you're creating. Okay, I'm going to call that. I would spend a little more time on that, but I want to get this, I want to get this, uh, done. There's new towels behind you. I should have worn a pair of gloves. Any questions, Frick, about what we're doing right now? about getting the scraper too sharp. Do you have to worry about getting the scraper too sharp? Now, first of all, I'm gonna hold this and you wanna, can you pick it up? Yeah. Okay, now what you see, this is, I give David Charlesworth this credit because he certainly inspired me, and, I'm, and and that's when I came up with this idea. But that, what I just did there, I think is impossible to do by just trying to use your fingertips. Now, Luther, you said, can you get it too sharp? He just wants to know, do you have to worry when you're doing all this? Do you have to worry about well, getting it too sharp? Well, I would sharp? say the next step. Well... Uh, I don't know if worry is... Uh, yeah, I, I kind of thought the better answer was you got to really worry about it being too dull. Not really have to worry yeah. about it. <laughs> well, yeah. no, but I think, I think applying the burr, you need to be... Yeah, well, we're, we'll, but let's take this one step at a time. So what you want to do is make sure that that surface is polished to the same level as that surface. And the, So now I've got a nice clean edge. So if I ran my fingernail along there, I don't find any any interruptions it's a nice smooth transition and when I plane a, when I sharpen a plane blade one of the quickest ways of telling if you've got a good edge this blades had some need some work but if you run your fingernail holding out like this and this is don't cut yourself but there's no reason to you run your fingernail along like that and if your fingernail catches in little places then you know you've got something going on in the cutting edge that is going is going to result in a serrated shaving when that, when that is a smooth transition from edge to edge, that's when you get the perfect shaving. So in this prep phase, there's no, in that prep work, there's no, there's nothing to worry about in terms of it being too uh, sharp. People use the term worry. Don't worry. Be happy. There's so nothing to worry about. Uh, another question lots of people are asking is for the, for the jig you made to hold the, the file square, if you don't have access to torrified wood, what would you use? Well, if you can wait, that's a product that's coming to the Cosman line. Um, well, that, that's the problem, right? If you use anything else, um, when I first started doing this, here's an example. I made it out of a piece of MDF, and I painted it numerous times. But you know what? I don't think you can prevent MDF from soaking up water. It, like, it finds it, and it goes to it. So this is no longer flat, and it's all puffy. You look like Mon uh, the puffy shirt. What was that? The, the what of Monte like Cristo? Count of Monte Cristo. Count of Monte Cristo. So 
you could use you could use any hardwood, but it's going to absorb moisture, and it's going to absorb moisture. It's going to go out of shape. I suppose you could you could experiment with. Uh, well, you don't want to use metal because you're running it over your stone. I had thought one time about making it out of aluminum, but then you're going to have you're going to clunk your stone up with aluminum bits. You don't want to use steel. I thought about uh, using the uh, the plastic stuff that we use for on cutting boards, but that's going to wear away rather quickly too. I know. I, I think the torfite is the answer, and you can maintain it because you're it's going to wear out of flat just because of the way you're putting pressure on it. But it's it's, it, it's a quick fix. Okay, where am I? Oh, I need my. So now I'm going to use. So our next step, and you can actually use it like this. In fact, I'm going to stop right here and tell you something. So when we do our shooting boards, Tony Bahadur is Mr. Sprayer, and Tony sprays all the shooting boards, and we have to sand in between, but we don't want to sand because it takes a long time and it's dusty. So we'll use a scraper to go in there, and it's in a fraction of the amount of time that it would take to sand. You can scrape that surface. Ken, give me an estimate. When Tony sprays a shooting board, how much time does it take with a scraper to prepare the first coat for the second coat. If it's even that long. It's really good. So if you're going to use it to scrape lacquer or urethane or anything where you need to you need to address the sprayed surface before you apply the next one. Excuse me, you don't want it any more aggressive than that. So that's just a square edge. And that will actually probably even cut wood. I'm gonna go ahead and do the edge. But let me show you what we're gonna do next. I'm going to put this in and we'll talk about uh, burnishers. Jake, do I have a round burnisher still around here anywhere? Around? Oh, wow. oh, I don't know. In back? In back of the chisel rack? I don't think so. They make round burnishers. The only thing I don't like about round burnishers is that if you think about it, a round burnisher that maybe is a, ha like a screwdriver is the point of contact is so small if you, if you push down a little bit harder in one spot, I don't know if you're going to get a nice straight edge. You're actually going to get some little indents. So there's a burnisher I bought from uh, Glenn Drake a long time ago. But my goodness, I spent, oh, hours and hours, days trying to polish that back. And then I got thinking about it. I said, why not just use your, your chisel? The chisel's harder than this, right? This is 60-62, this is 50-52. So you can, and you've already polished up the back of your chisel anyway in, in preparing it, so use the back of your chisel. Um, what have we got here for a little bit of oil? Mm. Tongue. I got some three-in-one. How does Luther say oil again? It's uh, Earl. Earl. <laughs> it's Earl. E Pronounce it the right way, please. <laughs> so what we want to do, I'll draw it. We've got a square edge like this right now. We've polished this surface. We polished that surface. Now what we want to do is we want to create a little bit of a hook like that to give us an even more aggressive edge that'll, that we can cut with. Don't want to do too much. You do too much and you can roll it right around and then you end up with something, something like this. And, and, and you actually can't even get your, you can't even get it to bite the wood because it's like raising your blade up too high when you're doing your tertiary bevel. So you can't have it tucked in there too far. So this would probably be where that guy would have to worry about making it too sharp. Well, there's some technique that you got to play around with. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to set it like that. And I'm going to look down there and I think that's probably just a little bit too much. So I've got this in my bench and that's, maybe even a little bit too much drop it down a little bit further okay now if I want you want to make sure that that's sitting level yeah I'm gonna take a uh, well, you know what that's close enough I'm gonna take a piece of wood okay and I'm going to put a little bit of all. Earl. 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 And that's just to lubricate it. Now, 
you might not want to be grabbing that sharp edge of the... Frick, do you want to demonstrate this part? Actually, uh, I've been getting a few digs here already. Yeah, have you? Yeah, we're, we're wondering if they cut zip ties as efficiently <laughs> as chisels. Maybe. <laughs> so I'm applying a, a little bit of pressure. And I'm going forward and back. Now, Jake, do that and, ex and explain to them. Don't drag this way. Feel like a pretty sharp edge? Well, about 90%. 90? That's okay. Good. Well, if Super Dave was here, we'd get it perfect, but he's not. So now let's try it out. Now, normally you would polish this side. I mean, if you want to be really efficient, you would go in and you would end up with one, two, three, four polished surfaces so that you get a lot of, a lot of, uh, um, use. use, yeah, before you have to go back. I'm just going to, I'm going to, Take a little walk here and see if I can find Go to something. a med stash. Oh, yes, a med stash. My expensive Luther, stuff. you got anything to say? To a med? No, just in general. <laughs> let me think, let me talk on it for a while. He doesn't talk in general terms. <laughs> Is that a dig? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can only talk in kernel terms, sorry. <laughs> Well, you're moving like pond water over there, Rob. What? Let's go. Pond what? You're moving like pond water. This stuff's expensive. I'm trying to decide which one I can afford to work. So I've got some palfero. Some. Where do we get palfero? He sent it. I met. I got some um, Benson wood, also known as Vera, and I have got a pink piece of pink ivory. So let's put this in the vise. We'll do the. So when I talk about hard hardwood, this would fall into that category. In fact, just for just for your information, Jake, where is it? South America. So we this this is a wonderful chart. Did we ever look into getting these, Luther? These, what did we look? These no. charts? No. So if we go, this is our this is our worldwide woods ranked by hardness, and it categorizes them: North America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Central America, South America, Pacific Islands, Australia. The hardest wood is that stuff from Australia. Yeah, Woody, what's it called? Wadi wood. Wadi wood. Wadi wood. wood. Upper left hand corner. I think. Upper left hand. Yeah, right there. Wadi wood. Yep. So just just for an example, because people think of. Uh, Maple is being hard. So if we go to North America and we find... Maple's at 14. Where is it? We'll look for 1,400. 14, 14. Um, somewhere in Hard maple. So hard maple comes in at 1,450... What do you say? Yankas? Jankas. Jankas. 1,450. And down here, Wadi Wood is 4,630. Just a little bit tougher. So if we go over here and we find Vera wood, also known as Argentine lignin. Is it the same thing? Yeah. Is that what Vera is? So that's 3,600. So that's, what was uh, maple 36 again? 36 and 14. So almost three times harder than maple. Okay. We're a little bit of a timeline with Zeke. <laughs> Are we? Yeah, okay, so we're about 15 me. minutes late right now. So he, you he, want to? ready? Yeah. Okay. Well, here, I'll just do this real quick. Come over here. So here's what I'm going to do, and you, you'll find the uh, angle of attack, and the angle of attack is going to vary based on um, based on how aggressive you were with your burnisher, and you'll you'll find it because you'll just have to move it. So I've, I'm holding it like this. I've got these fingers in the back. I've got my thumbs. I got these fingers in the front. My my fingers and the thumbs in the back, and I'm just going to push that until I can pick up a shaving. Now this. So this is the thin one. This is probably coming in at, is this 15 thou? I think this is maybe 20. And I can feel that flexing quite a bit, which means I, that's one of the reasons why I would have preferred to use a, uh, I would have preferred to use a thicker scraper. Why does that happen? The why that does that happen is because it came it uh, stopped sh stopped short. That's his move. Did you? 
Ken? What? Stop short with my wife? <laughs> so this is pink ivory. You should try and get that poster. We have a lot of people interested. In, they won't. A lot of people want it. Yeah, I know. We, we would love to. We'll try to source it because it's, it's really just for general interest sake. But isn't that cool? Now, it's not too hot yet, but it's, it's warming up. Okay, sure, go ahead. Right. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll pick up some questions on this, but Luther has a very, sp I don't even know, I have no idea what's coming next. I only have heard little bits and pieces, but I'm going to turn the time over to well, Let me come in here, Luther. so... Uh, um, so I just wanted to uh, uh, highlight uh, a special combat, a wounded warrior who's, who's also a craftsman, and Ahmed, our buddy Ahmed and me, we were looking around uh, the internet, and uh, uh, this wounded warrior's name is Zeke uh, Kozier, and he's out of Kansas City, Kansas, and uh, he's a, a unique craftsman, not a He's not a woodworker, and uh, we had him custom make for us his specialty, and Ahmed and I are donating this piece that I'm going to unveil in just a second to our workshop uh, for the training the hand workshop and the PHP workshop, and so we've got to find a special place in it so anyone who comes to our workshops can see it. So this is Zeke's work, and if you can help me hold that. Oh, cool. Look at that. So, Oh, these are, uh, this is what you're talking about, the yeah, so if you can, obviously it's the American flag and the Canadian flag. You, this mean, is, you mean the Canadian flag and the American flag? No, this is the American flag on top, the Canadian flag <laughs> on the bottom. So, uh, well, it, typical, we're your base. Yeah, keep okay, it there sturdy. you go. So I don't know if you can Foundation. zoom. Foundation. If you can zoom in, but you can look. These are all bottle caps. So these are. You See know, this most? These are all bottle caps that that Zeke gets. And he makes and he crafts into unique custom works. And I'm, uh, uh, I'm going to give him a, a, a couple of plugs here. Uh, his business is called uh, Handy Cap'n. So that's Cap'n, C-A-P-P-I-N. So Handy Cap'n, one word, dot org. And he's got a lot of uh, pictures on his side. And he's done some just really incredible work. This is... Um this is uh, resin. Resin. It's right. all resin. So it's, he does it, and then he he covers it in resin. Uh, How does he get all the air out from underneath the uh, caps? Well, we're going to talk to Zeke in about 10 minutes, and and maybe we can ask him, and I don't know, maybe he'll tell a secret, or maybe that's a, a trade secret with Zeke. He, Zeke just landed on the airplane, so he can't hear us. He's standing by with Frick on the phone. But what I want to first do is... Uh, uh, Zeke's army, uh, an army combat wounded warrior, and we want to play uh, a short, about an eight-minute clip, and it tells Zeke's story of how he gets wounded and how he ends up here. And so, Frick, are you ready with that? Yep. yep. So, so go ahead. Let's go ahead and play that, and then as soon as it's over, we'll get Zeke on the phone and we'll talk to him. So many other guys that I served with and girls did so much more than, than what I ever did. The difference is I got hurt. I could have let that define who I was, but I, I didn't allow that. So I've, I've rewritten my story and used the negative, and, and I'm making it positive. July 16, 1984, and lived primarily in Kansas and Missouri my whole life. So I graduated in 2002. I didn't immediately enter into the military. I went to college for a couple years. My brother was in the Marine Corps. I was going to follow his footsteps. But uh, when I went to the Marine Corps, they couldn't guarantee me a, you know, a job, a position. So I went next door to the, the Army recruiter, and, and I made it right in on, on that side. And so June of 2004 is when I enlisted in the Army. I joined the, uh, the Army Reserve. I enlisted in the Army Reserve unit in New Century, Kansas. It's uh, the Chinook helicopter unit. I was a 15 uniform is what I, what I enlisted as a uh, Chinook helicopter repairman. Basic training was in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. 
But after basic training, you have to report to AIT, which is that's where your school, that's where I got my wings, and that was in Fort Eustis, Virginia. So there was an earthquake in Pakistan, and that was a humanitarian mission. So we got called up fast. It was a quick turnaround on that. So we got mobilized, and then we went directly into Afghanistan for the combat mission. It was the end of 2005 to the end of 2006. And then 2009 was, the, uh, was Uganda, Africa. That was the humanitarian mission to Africa. The Chinook has uh, five crew members, two pilots, uh, and then three backseaters. I, I loved flying, especially night uh, under goggles. That was my favorite thing ever. So we deployed in 2011 to Afghanistan uh, in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. We went directly into Fob Shank, and that was cold. It was in the mountains. It was small, and it was a target. Extortion was the was gonna, that was going to be our uh, the call sign for our company. June 25 was the day that you know my crash was, and so we traveled from Shank to Jalalabad for this multi-day resupply, infill, exfill of troops type of event. I remember bits and pieces of it. And that's generally the difficulty that I have with, with telling my story, right? It's almost as if I'm telling somebody else's version of my story uh, without, without certainty. I recall the briefing, I recall going to the chow hall, uh, getting some food and then heading out to the aircraft. The five of us were out there and we snapped some photos and little did I know that would become like the infamous image for us and for the other Extortion 17 crash. The crew of the five of us from Extortion 17, we've got Brian Nichols, uh, Kirk Heikendall, Buddy Lee, John Brooks, and then myself, Zeke Crozier on the, on the far right. The Chinooks, help, it's big, you know, it's a target, and so we lived at dark. Plus you wanna get, you wanna get these guys when, when they're not alert and, and awake during the day. So we had some ground guys, infantry. Um, the mission was to uh, infill troops into LZ Honey Eater. Um, it was really windy, it was really dark, uh, zero loom, and you're under goggles 100%. It's a full house, I mean, and so, obviously the Chinook has two engines, but uh, at that altitude and that much weight, it's not gonna operate with one engine. And so, I was on the ramp, my job was to clear the trees and clearance and then, you know, clear to come down. The terrain at where we were landing was was a mess. It was rocky. It was, you know, uneven. You get trees. Uh, we passed the trees, and I stayed clear to come down. And then I called out RPG at the six o'clock position, and, and I thought it missed. And then I called out small arms. Again, I wasn't certain if it hit us or not. Uh, Buddy had said that he went to pull thrust and pull power. Uh, to level uh, to pull back up and uh, the, the number two engine was pegged so basically the number two engine we lost that that was the side that the RPG and the and the small arms uh, you know was coming from it's estimated that it's somewhere between 100 and 150 feet that we dropped uh, I was on the ramp I was tied in connected from the helicopter to to my back and so I got thrown around when we, when we landed um, I was knocked unconscious and so somewhere on the ramp is where I was laying uh, I'm not sure how any of the guys got out um, other than the ramp, but I imagine them all climbing over me out the back of the ramp. Blessed to have a couple amazing pilots, the way that they managed that and held the stick, but they landed flat and everything that was supposed to happen on the helicopter did. The fuel pods, they popped off, and then the aft pylon rotated around to the right side the way it's supposed to. You know. Whether it was part of the pylon getting ripped off as well, but it just like it's like a can opener, it just kind of peeled the, the roof off the, the backside. Everybody, you know, rolled out, rallied up, and then they found out, I guess, at some point they said, hey, where's Zeke? Zeke's not here. So they all had to come back and find me. I guess my ear was bleeding from what they said. Uh, they said my left leg, they splinted it because they thought it was broke. So the impact went to the right side of my head affected the left side of my body and so partially paralyzed immediately. 
one of the squad leaders. He said this, he said, we saw that guy, that guy was on the ramp, he died. He was dead. They thought I was gone. I think initially they said there were like three or four heroes. To be considered a hero, it means you're gone. So I was called a hero initially. It's pretty amazing that, that no one was killed in this crash, especially seeing the photos. I was uh, taken to Bagram, Afghanistan, and then from there I was sent to Lansdale, Germany. And then once I was stable enough, they sent me to Bethesda, Maryland. When I was in Maryland, I was essentially in, in a coma. That's where Lacey and my mom met me. Once I was well enough and out of the coma and ready for some kind of rehab, I was flown to uh, the VA hospital in Minneapolis, Minnesota. You excited to be out here, Zeke? Basically, it was like I had a stroke. So the left side, my muscles would drop, my face drooped. Uh, I had to relearn my motor skills, um, walking, speech again. Um, and so that's what I suffer from is a traumatic brain injury and, and it's unseen, right? I still appear and look like I'm normal. In the beginning, I was in rehab all day long. I would still wear the uniform, I'd go to, to my duty station and then I would go to CBWTU, community-based uh, warrior transition unit. And I was initially temporary retired. It's TDRL, temporary duty retirement list, but also dealing with like surgeries. I had a surgery on my hand um, and, and just going through treatment, things like that, until they could finally get me through the med board. What am I being judged on? How I was initially, right? How bad was my injury initially? Or was I being judged on how I looked, how I was starting to look, because I was starting to appear like, you look fine. Oh wait, you were a helicopter crash. So the process being retired out, uh, it was difficult. And anytime you try to apply for something, a program, assistance, uh, one of the first questions they ask you is, Do you, are you a Purple Heart recipient? And I'm sitting there going, I'm, I think I should be. And so I needed help getting my Purple Heart. So I went into his office and that picture was on the wall. I met uh, Congressman Kevin Yoder before my first deployment and that's where that picture was taken. And I was like, hey, that's me. So. Little did I know that I'd be going in to see him after my second combat mission to Afghanistan. And uh, he helped me get my, my benefits and my Purple Heart. They completed the med ward and of course I was 100% medically retired. 29 and being retired out of the army, um, I thought that was my purpose. I thought that was what I was gonna do the rest of my life. I was, you know, I was gonna be a, a lifer. Now I have to find a new vision. and. I've always had that, the mindset though, to, to not give up. So after I was injured, we uh, ended up getting a lake lot. People kept throwing bottle caps around on the ground. And so I was just trying to police everything up and get it in one place. And so I just was messing around. I went to go sm you know, hit, a, hit a bottle cap with a hammer and I totally missed and it made me angry. And then I realized it was making me hit a consistent spot, location, multiple times. And so I ended up smashing all these bottle caps Nailed all the bottle caps down uh, into this incredible piece of art, I suppose, if you want to call it that. I started messing with epoxies, and then I got into resins. I think it gave me a, a purpose. Handicapping, that came about because I was sitting in a handicapped spot with my permit and trying to put a name together, and it just, the name came, Handicapping. Uh, people wanted to purchase these things, and so it was like, here's my, my outlet for, for, you know, income. And then as my story continues on, I want to help people, right? And so now Handicapping has become an organization that can create art and that the money, the income that's generated from selling my art, auctioning it off, that can be gifted basically to the other, to the organization or nonprofit and impact and affect lives. There's two extortion 17 crashes and Part of my legacy is to, to honor the fallen, and uh, every time I get an opportunity, I like to talk about the other crash, the other Exorcism 17, the true heroes. And so Brian Nichols was the pilot on my crash. He was uh, also the pilot in the other Exorcism 17 crash where they were all killed. So that's a hard pill to swallow. Um, I think that's why I have the passion to continue with what I'm doing now and you know my art and, and remembering them and honoring them any way that I can. Uh, I'm a Chinook guy. Um, I'm proud of being a hooker. 
That's what they call us. Once you're in the hooker community, you, you're you part of that community, and it's a, it's like a band of brothers. So it looks like we're about 30 minutes ahead of the schedule with our airspeed. About 100 Hey, yeah, Zeke, this is uh, this is uh, Luther. It's Colonel Seely. How you doing? Hey, how's it going, Luther? Good to hear from you. Oh uh, yeah, it's been a long time. Hey, we just we just revealed your your artwork and we watched your your story. And I hadn't seen the uh, the work in about a year. It's it's been that long since we got it. I uh, I, I really appreciate you making it for us, and it's a it's a uh, you know it's a great work, and I think it's going to be a super addition uh, to our train the hand workshop area. So I got Rob Kosman. Uh, it's outstanding. Yeah. I, yeah. I got thank, Rob Kosman. I know you guys my, have never met. Purpose, we'll just have to do a voice meet. So, uh, th so Zeke, this is Rob. Zeke, I, I'm, I'm looking here, but I'm wanting to look over there because your face is actually over there. But I, I have a really good friend, Danny Bell, who was a, a Chinook helicopter pilot. Danny retired last year, medically retired. I don't know whether you guys know each other or not, but respect for what you people do. Thank you. Well, ask me a question about the... Oh, <laughs> how did you do the pour and get all the air out from underneath the caps? You there, guys? I'm having a hard time hearing you. I apologize. But, but, do I need to stand closer yeah, over yeah, here? Yeah, a little closer. So my, my question is, how did you... When you do the pour with the caps, how do you get all the air out from underneath the caps? Uh, well, that's, I, that's a special trait that I do, a trick that I do that I... I hate to expose that to all these crafters out there, you know? See, I told you uh, you wouldn't give it away. Fair enough. Fair I told enough. you you wouldn't give it away. It looks great. It'll yeah, make a, it'll I make give a all the cheat codes away, you know? <laughs> I follow a lot of uh, a lot of bottle cap artists. They follow my work as well, and it's all self-taught, you know what I mean? And so it's a blessing, uh, and, and I, I just I feel like it happened for a reason, and then there's a reason why I'm able to do what I do. And uh, it's a gift that I... I can't claim for myself. I believe a higher power gave it to me, and I'm just supposed to share it with the world, you know? Uh, and I just continue to learn, you know, I just, if it doesn't work, I change it, I do something different. And, uh, man, it's, it's cool, and I'm blessed to be able to do it. That's for sure. So do you have work for sale now? So that's the thing. I've got a few pieces uh, on hand at the local VFW out here. And, uh, but that's the thing is what, I learned a long time ago that when somebody wants to wants a piece of my art, they want to customize it. So if I make art and have it laying around, you're going to look at it and go, "I like that," but I want to I want to do something different. And so uh, I might have a like a flag or something with uh, with beer caps, and maybe you don't want beer caps, so or you want different colors and things like that. So I've got a handful of pieces, but for the most part, I just I'd rather make them to order if that makes sense. Okay, so how does somebody, you, you, we, uh, our platform will be viewed by, oh, anywhere from twenty to 50,000 people over the next year. How do they reach you? Wow, that's awesome. Uh, well, I've got a, a presence on social media, for sure. So, like, the Instagram page, the Facebook page, I've got a website, uh, Um it, it, The book list that I sent out uh, up there, I believe, Luther, you might have them still. Uh, I can send some more if you let me know. But uh, on the back page, there's all the links, all the social media. That's the best way to support it. Uh, honestly, the punchline, the art's cool, right? But the, the punchline is my story, and I know that. So that's that's really what I what I what I like to use is my story to inspire other people to to not give up and to keep trying. So if you if you're able to share the the uh, the documentary that you just watched, uh, that's the way to go right there to share that, spread the word, and uh, and then uh, and then yeah, just social media pages follow along. Uh, I'm taking orders all the time. I don't ever turn anybody down. Uh, and, and then my big thing now is I, I team up with uh, nonprofit organizations 
and I make art for their fundraisers and things like that. I, ra I raised seventy-four thousand dollars last year for various uh, nonprofit organizations. Awesome. All by myself with my art. So that's what I really enjoy doing. My passions with that right there. Uh, Zeke, I, I have a couple of people asking in the chat. Do you accept donations of bottle caps as well, or do you have a source? No, for those? not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> no, thank you for that question. Uh, well, if you could imagine, I can't keep up with those donations. I've got number seven. I, I mean, at least I, I got a pound of seven hundred pounds of bottle caps in the mail one day, uh, which is outrageous. The pallet, it's huge. Uh, so I've got nowhere to put them, and, and being that. You get to customize your, your order, right? The bottle caps aren't going to match up with what you want. So I've got another one. I just order them for each project, and uh, and I can even print uh, custom bottle caps now, too. I can put your logo on, on the bottle cap, and uh, it just makes it completely you know, personalized and unique. So no bottle caps, please. I'm happy to send somebody else the bottle caps up if they're, <laughs> if they're interested. <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure there's a link in here, and it'll stay on there. So and and the video will show whenever anybody watches it. So we yeah. will. Uh, and, and if you don't mind, Zeke, I'll go ahead and put you uh, the link to your website up on our website. So it'll this video will show all over YouTube. People who watch it will be inspired by your story, and we'll, uh, hopefully they'll go to uh, handicapping.org. And uh, if they want you to get a custom art, they can contact you right on your contact uh, form on your website. Great Man, name. that's awesome. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much uh, for your support. Please let me know how I can support you as well. I mean, if you've got links and things like that, send them to me so I can also post and share and, and get the word out on the story as well for that. We, we will. We will. This has been wonderful. Thanks. And it'll find a great spot in our, in our shop. Yep. Well, thanks for being with that's us tonight, cool. Zeke. You guys can Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. If you guys can send me photos, too, of uh, the picture. So all my art is like my children. It's my kid right there you've got. Uh, I care about where it goes, how it's doing, things like that. So please send me photos, text it to me, slide, and uh, so I can advertise that as well. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for support. My purpose, this is my purpose now. So I, I really appreciate Grateful for the support. What? Wonderful, Zeke. Nice to meet you. Yes, sir. Thanks, guys. All take, right. take care and keep at it. Yes, sir. You do the same. Appreciate it. Thanks, Zeke. Are we back on? Yeah. yeah. Luthie, you got anything else to say? No. No. Uh, go back to straight. Give, give him another look. There you go. No. Oh, yeah. Right. Yep. Pick it up. It's oh. heavy. It's heavy. Oh, yeah. Got our purple heart logo in the middle. Yeah, that is cool. That is. Thank you. So on that note, let me just, uh, if, you, if you need to do some shopping, everybody always does. You've got birthdays, anniversaries, Valentine's. What else is there? Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day. It's always nice to give something unique, but what about giving something with purpose behind it? So you've got Zeke now to add to your list. I want to introduce, and, and uh, Moose has got a, if you want to see something really cute, so, uh, and Moose sports us in our, in our Purple Heart program, and he, he brought these, they're called Happy Sweaters, and they're handmade in on Peru, and uh, he put them on sale tonight, the regular 35 for 25 So if you go to patsecretgarden.com, you'll find them. There's all, they're all a little bit different because they're, they're done by hand. But uh, we got one for each of uh, Frick's little boys, and they love them. And it's cute when you see them running around in them, but they're just, they're just darling. Now, so I'm working with, uh, with five people. Uh, four of them are combat wounded vets have been in our program. Danny, Kevin, Jeff, and Bob. And Danny, no, pardon me, Jeff and Kevin, oh, and, and Ahmed. But of the, of the four combat wounded vets, three of them have websites that are up and running. 
and these guys are uh, are 100% disabled, um, uh, 100% disability from the military, and uh, they're dealing with like Zeke uh, traumatic brain injuries, PTSD. You get your brain rattled around that bad. Uh, I can only imagine. My the little experience I have is it's for some of them it's like living in in fog. It just nothing is clear and it so hard to get a thought to go from one side of your brain to the other. So uh, they're really taking a big step and, and starting their own business. Now, these guys do great work, and that's why I think you should consider uh, patronizing them. So Bob makes a whole series of cutting boards, and he's really got this down. So if you go to the vintageveteran.com, you'll see Bob's work. He's got some new boards that'll make you dizzy. If you go to um, uh, O'Connor Woodworks, how do you spell O'Connor, Luther? Oh, do you want me to spell the South Carolina no, way? No, no, never mind. Or all you other if folks If you guess, way. you'll be a bit closer. So O'Connor Woodworks, and Jeff has lots of stuff on there as well. And um, Kevin, so I, I can't wait. to. I ordered a couple pieces from Kevin, and hopefully we'll have them here soon. But um, Kevin does some laser engravings on Slate and also on granite. And the one I bought from him, I've got some sand that was sent to me. I have two samples of sand. One came from, is sand that actually came from the beach of Iwo Jima, which is that black sand, that black uh, lava sand. And the other one is uh, sand that came from Utah Beach, which is where the D-Day landings took place. So Kevin, in his, uh, these pieces of slate that Kevin has, one has the U.S. flag with the uh, the soldiers raising the flag on Mount uh, Mount Sirabachi. Did I pronounce that right, Luther? Yep, yep, you did good. And the other one is the American did you flag. Just ask Luther. <laughs> <laughs> the other one is the American flag with uh, D-Day landing on it. Just, I mean, you will be so impressed when you see these, and they sit on a stand. So check out Kevin's work at. Uh, Burris B U R A S Woodworking dot com. So there's three for you to go for to check out. Danny, when Danny's is up and ready, we'll tell you about it. Now Jesse Rufianj had sent these as a fundraiser, and we just we we got a little bit of stuff to tie up in that. But I just want to show you them because I thought they're really cool. When they first came, I didn't know what they were. Is that yours, Ken? Where's mine? I didn't know what this thing was. I unpacked it because. Uh, but this is where you put your cell phone. So you can either set your cell phone on there like that, or you can set it on there like that, whichever way. And this is for, Frick, what do you use this for? I don't know. Looks like a big Scraping wooden. Scraping the road kill off. Oh, barbecue. yeah, it's for a barbecue. This is a barbecue scraper. It looked like a big wooden chisel there. For a I second. don't know. Is Jesse, got a, is Jesse, <laughs> Jesse, if you've got a site, if Jesse, if your site is up and running, or how people can get a hold of you, put it in the chat, because I wasn't sure. I don't know if he has his website up and running yet or not. Yeah, we got them rubber ones for Christmas. I think that is that covers all that I wanted to say on that. Yep, all those website links are, are on our website. Oh on yeah, they're not just in the chat, but w Luther also has a page called Other Stuff on Other Stuff on our website, and we're going to expand that to help these guys, give them some exposure, and get their help kickstart the business. So you can go on the our website under Other Stuff, and you'll find the links to these. Now, Ken, any more vets to say hello to? Yeah. I can't believe that. Okay, we only have back. 15 minutes. Okay, so more questions. All right, uh, question from Dwight in Dallas, Texas. Hey, Dwight. He says, should you raise the wood grain with water before you use a scraper? No, I, 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 I don't know where some of those things, I'm going to go a little off topic, but you often hear how people say, well, to get rid of glue squeeze out, use a damp cloth. Well, to me, all that does is spread it all over the place. You don't find it until you go to put a finish on. And raising the grain with water beforehand, I don't know why. I, I've never felt that to be necessary. You saw what we just did with these really hard woods. So my answer to that would be no. Next question. Is there something that we we're supposed to talk about that, I, that we no. said... Do we cover it all? Just answer some questions. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, okay, next question comes from Robert in Switzerland. 
It's a multi-part uh, question. He says, what type of steel should be, specif- should be specified for the scrapers, i.e. hardness and grade, and what dimensions for the selection of scrapers? Sorry, Frank. Say that again, please. What type of steel should be specified for the scrapers, and what dimensions? Um, well, all I can do is tell you the dimensions of these, and they seem to work fine. So this is six inches by two and a half. And the ideal thickness, I think, is 25 thousandths of an inch. Some of these I have here are 20 thou. And uh, actually, I'm going to measure them just so that I can tell you for sure. So the one I've been using is 20 thou. So just so you, for reference purpose, that's the same thickness as the uh, steel blade on this Cosman dovetail saw. That's 20 thou as well. So this one, oh, that's actually 35 thou, 30 thou, Jake. Wow, that's thicker. That's thicker still. This is my, uh, my <laughs> tenon saw and my medium tenon are 25 thou. So that's actually a 30 thou, and then I don't have a 15 here, but I know, at least I don't think we do. That's, I'm sure that's a 20, that's a 20 as well. So that's the thickness of the steel. What type of steel? I'm sorry, I, I really, I don't get, an, I don't know enough about the steel to actually tell you that if you're trying to make it. And what was the other question, Frick? Size, you already did it. Size, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. Next. Uh, can, this is from Doc Bailey in Nebraska. Hey, Doc. He says, uh, can you show the correct setup for a scraper plane? Just kind of did that, I think. Correct setup? For a scraper plane? Well, so if you were going to use this if you were going to use this plane, I don't know if I have time to go through that. Sharpening it? No. Okay, so, well, it, it's got a bit of an edge on there now, so we'll see if we can do it. So I would, no, so the only thing I would do different here, whereas that's not square, is I would treat this just like you would a plane blade. So you've gone in, you've created your primary bevel in the bench grinder, only you would, I would have that instead of 25 degrees, I'd have that probably 45 degrees. I would go to my stone, find the primary, come up a little bit higher, do my secondary, go over to my finest stone, my 16,000, come up a little bit higher, do my tertiary, put pressure on each corner for a few seconds, the opposite corner and create that little feathering effect. You do, you do your back bevel just like you would. And then I would put it in the, in, the, uh, in the vise and I would roll that little burr. Not too much, you don't want to bring it all the way around. You just want to create a bit of a cutting edge. Can you roll a burr on that? Uh, well, you, you can roll it on this a lot easier than this just because of the difference in the thickness. But let's try this out and see. I just mean with the hard with as the hard, hard as it is. Blade. Yeah, I think you still can. So I would set that on a flat surface. So the bevel is going to be facing the back of the plane, and this angle. You, I mean, there's what you have for vary for varying that angle, but it's going to be somewhat in the middle of that setting. I don't know if there's any real reason why to move it one way or the other. So holding the plane down, I push a little bit of downward pressure and then tighten it up with that thumb knob. I'll use some uh, sponsor Cosman Magic Plane Wax. I don't want to make this too obvious. On the sole to reduce the friction. Now, I'm not picking up anything right there. So what I can do is this is going, because the pivot pin is right here and the blade is ahead of it. So as I tilt that forward, that blade is going to project down. It's, either it's going to be, it's going to come out and, and uh, pick up some wood. So what I'm going to do is if I want to move it forward, that means I've got, to, I've got to turn this one clockwise and this one counterclockwise. So I'll just back back one off as I advance the other. Don't Are those just like two nuts tightening on each other? Yeah, yeah. So in order to move one, you got to move the other. That's almost too aggressive. 
come back at all. Well, I'm pulling the shaving off. You just got to get serious with it. But that's what you're pulling off. And that's a, that's a nice mousse. And that's actually a good example of a wood to use it on. So do you see how these bands of grain run? So this one, the fibers are running that way. This one, the fibers are running this way. That way, this way, that way, this way, that way, this way. You try to plane that, you get smooth, torn, smooth, torn, smooth, torn. And even with a high angle, uh, with a blade pitched at a high angle, that'll still frequently on a hardwood like that will tear. So in that application, the scraper is your best bet. Now, this one doesn't have any kind of an advancement. So I would set it up the same way, drop the blade down in on a flat surface, put some downward pressure in there, snug it up, and then as I start planing, I would just take my little brass hammer and I would just tap that ever so slightly and you have to tap one side to the other to get it so that it's cutting um, with a uniform thickness side to side until you finally get it where you want it. Or something else you can do is take a really thin shim or a shaving. Yeah, I wouldn't want to use that, I want one that's laying a little bit flatter. You could take a shaving. This piece of paper would be a little too aggressive, but I'll, I'll show you for the sake of showing you. On a flat surface, set it down like that. Then as you drop that blade down, that's going to allow that to be sticking out just a little bit lower than the surface of the plane because the nose, was the toe was sitting up a little bit. And you can just play around with that until you get exactly <coughs> right. But not, I, they're not, um, they're, they don't, they're not as easy a setup as a hand plane, but they're not terribly difficult either. But you gotta spend the money, get good ones, makes it so much easier. Of course, the, the edge you put on it is, is everything. If you don't get that, no matter what you do, it's not going to work. So Rob, I'm getting a lot of questions on the chat. I think it's worthwhile going over kind of the thought process of, you know, when do you use the scraper? I know we said it, but people still aren't getting it. We're talking so much about well, scrapers. When, what are you doing with the scraper and, and what's your progression and thought process of when to reach for one? So here's a good, here's a good example, and I'll go through this again. So on this particular wood, Babinga's the same way. Um, Purple Heart would be another one. But on this particular piece of wood, this band right here, this dark band, the grain is running in that direction. So if I was going to plane this, I'd plane it that way. But then if you look, or if, I don't know if you can see it, but from my perspective, this is shiny, this is dull. This is shiny, dull, shiny, dull, shiny, dull. It goes all the way across. And the dull is when the grain is running toward me. So that would be the part that if you were planing, it was going to, it would tear. That is definitely an example of when you would want to use a scraper. And that feels like lovely and smooth. Nice and smooth. Um, another example. I, I don't consider that to be an example. That's a piece of English walnut. And you can see the figure in it. You should be able to plane that. That wood, should, you should be able to plane that to perfection. Well, wouldn't you go through your steps with the plane first? Uh, reduce the thickness of the blade. Close the throat down to see if you could bring... Yeah, I would exhaust... I would exhaust everything I know about using a plane before I would turn to a scraper. But experience has also taught me that, um, for instance, Purple Heart, it just, that stuff just does not want to plane. So I don't even think I would attempt it. I would just go right to the scraper. However, yeah, I think you can, you're going to definitely can remove wood a lot faster with a plane than you can with a scraper. But if you can get it close and then go in and just do the, the final finish... I wouldn't want to have to do any. I wouldn't have to want to have to do any amount of shaping with the scraper. It'll take a little bit of work, but for a final finish to get rid of some machine marks, absolutely. So, so the harder the wood, the better it will scrape. Most, I'll say it again. Most domestic hardwoods, regardless of the figure, you can you can plane those. Uh, you get into. Uh, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. The harder the wood, the more likely it will respond better to a scraper than a plane. And when you get down in, and when we talk about hardness, like I said, so we think of maple as being hard. Well, that, uh, that stuff, that vera wood that we used was three times harder than maple. And it is, it is heavy. I've got snake wood over there. What's snake wood? Is it 40? 
Remember? It's right there. Check it out. I think it's number what four. What country? In South America. It, yes. South, South America. America. Number four. Three. Snakewood. So we we were playing with Vera Wood, which is 3,600. Snakewood is 3,800. So harder still. If you get into those really hard woods, definitely get a scraper. Should you have a scraper? Yeah. I would probably suggest that everybody have something like that because that's just a really inexpensive tool. But when you buy it, that sole is never flat, but it's not a big surface, so you can go in there and fix that yourself. And it's it's not a difficult one. And you can go in and you can uh, you know sharpen both ends so that when one wears, you can just flip it around and use the other one. That's not a hard that's not a hard tool to get used to using. Kind of like a big spoke shave. You're pushing like that. I have an open grip. I have my two thumbs in here just to help distribute the pressure properly. You don't have a huge sole, so you want to keep you want to keep from tipping to one side or the other. Okay, we're out. okay. I'll, I'll wrap it up by saying this: If I was going out and buy and just getting into woodworking and wanted to explore scrapers, I would start here. I get a couple of these, couple of different thicknesses. See which one you like. Like I said, no big deal, no big cash outlay. Next thing, I, next place I would venture into would be this, and then I would probably do just because of the cost, this and that. Now, where would I really spend my money? Over here. You have to have good stones. If you don't have good stone, all of this stuff works. All of these tools work based on how good the edge is. And it always comes off and sound like a salesman. Listen, all I'm trying to do is try to get you to a point that you're happy with the success you're having. You want to do it the same way I do it? Just go buy the same material I use. Then you're just left having to do monkey see, monkey do. Follow what Rob does. You're using the exact same equipment. You should get the exact same results. You can go on our website and look at the systems. I'm a huge fan of Shapton. I think it is absolutely the best stuff out there. But you got to pay for the best stuff. It doesn't come cheap, but it'll last you a long time, and it'll make this pleasurable. We have uh, we have a scrape. We were doing inventory today with Luther, and we we've got lots of uh, scraping wood videos. So in this, I cover all of this stuff in great detail. So if you want some help with your scraping wood, you might want to pick up one of those. Oh shoot! DVD. It's nice. The DVD, DVD video. You, DVD. Yeah, is that what I said? Yeah, you didn't mention it. That that oh. it was one of our DVDs or videos. Yeah. That. Oh no, you mean on demand. No, I'm sorry. You, yeah. Yeah, that's what yeah, so you can have it in you can have it in DVD form or you can also buy it on demand where you get it instantly. Ray, Ray Gore has been on. Ray, Ray, cool Ray. Hey Ray. One of my one of my favorite vets, favorite of all time. Ray's Vietnam vet. Used to drive a mule in Vietnam. If you haven't don't know what a mule is, check it out. It's cool. Okay. Anybody else can? How'd we do tonight? How many how many things are we giving away? Who's keeping track? I texted you. you texted me? You? Yes. I don't have access to that information. I texted you. Oh, the, the amount. Number. Okay. Are we get Not my job. Here? So we're only giving away one. One? Yeah. All right. One draw. Uh, don't forget. Oh, well, let's give away our three dead cats. So these draws, you can have your choice between a dead cat sweater or a, go a go golf shirt over here with Purple Heart. Get the golf shirt, it'll bring summer a little bit closer. And before we do the draw, you have to hit the like button because we're low on likes. And don't forget to subscribe as well. So all of this SEO stuff, is that what that falls under, Luther? Yep. If you don't know anything about SEO, don't ask me because I don't either, but it's important. So hit the like button, smash that. What's the, what did they smash? Smash the like button. Hit the subscribe. Oh, hit the subscribe. Smash the like. And ring the notification Don't button. forget to turn on the notification. Flipping. Flipping. We, got, we got a new... <coughs> when, when he said that he doesn't know what SEO, SEO is either, it reminded me of that Kramer scene. <laughs> I don't either. But they do. <coughs> yeah. And they're the ones writing it off. <laughs> they're the ones and they're the ones writing. Uh, we got a new video coming out this week on YouTube. It'll be a good one. I won't let the cat out of the bag, but we just shot it last week. Luther's going home tomorrow, so wish him Godspeed. Have a safe trip home. I'm hoping that the airport uh, is shut down. He'll stay for another week. We'll get more done. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hopefully Eric is not watching. All right, we're ready. Let's do a draw. Okay, what are we giving away first? Dead cat. Dead cat. First dead cat. Chances of winning this evening, one in 540.
First Dead Cat is going to Todd Laginus. I think we asked one of his questions earlier. He's in Fairborn, Ohio. Hey, Todd. Good time to have a dead cat sweater. I'm sure it's cold in Ohio. Next one. Number two. It's going to Brian Bochia in Washington. Washington, yeah, Brian. Washington. More correctly pronounced Washington. Washington. Congratulations. It, what dead cat won't keep you dry, but it will keep you warm. And this is another dead cat? Yeah. And it is going to John McConaughey in Louisiana. It would be John Louis- in Louisiana. That'd be Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> that, they're cozy. A dead cat is cozy. I'd wear it down there. So now we have to decide whether or not we're going to give away a Bob board or, uh, or a Jeff... Um, shaving kit. Shaving kit. How are we going to do that? Let's, anybody have a coin? Why don't we let them pick when they win? They can contact us. Oh, yeah, us. okay. Well, so, I think you need to determine which, I mean, there's a price difference in the two cutting no, boards. Uh, no, that, no. Well, if we're, do, we're doing this, this okay. cutting, either this cutting board or one of Jeff's um, brushes. Shave, shave bowls and brushes with the soap. So, your choice. Who's, who's getting it, Frick? It is going to... Here's a coin. Oh, they're going to... Uh, Paul Gogol in South Australia. What's his name? Paul Gogol. Hey, Paul in or South Gogel. Australia. Tony's in uh, Melbourne. Tony's a good friend of ours. Talked to him on the phone just the other day. Which is South Australia. Is, is South Australia? Yeah, Melbourne's in Southern Australia. Yeah, well, there they, you They talk like me there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the yeah, un- only place in the world they understand them. Great to have them. Thank you, for everybody, for being here tonight. Thank you, folks, for joining in with us. Thank you for your support of the Purple Heart Project. We have our fingers crossed so tight we have no blood left in them that we will be able to have our classes sooner rather than later. I can't say a date, but uh, I'm praying that it's really quick. So... We will uh, keep you up to date. As soon as we know something, you'll know it. Anybody have anything? Left? Any closing remarks? Luther, go right on tight. Go tight. Go tight on Luther. He showered today. <laughs> we can first tell. time. I smell good now. <laughs> You're Anybody stressing about inventory. I'm good. He's good. I'm he's, good. He's also camera shy. <laughs> All right, we'll see you in two weeks. Have a wonderful two weeks. In the meantime... Take care of everyone. See you.